You can talk about anything with such an experienced man who has lived several lives packed into one. He's seen, done, and met everyone. From Sammy Davis Jr. to Elvis Presley. He's taken Audrey Hepburn on dates, punched Robert Redford in the nose, and has starred in over eight different shows and movies. I especially like the part about punching Robert Redford in the nose. Just kidding, of course. Please support the Break It Down show by doing a monthly subscription to the show. All of the money you invest goes directly to supporting the show. Also, join us in supporting Save the Brave as we battle PTSD on www.savethebrave.org. So thank you for being loyal fans and enjoy today's episode. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg this is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, Garrett. <laughs> Here to say hi. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, we're on the Break It Down show. So Hank is, uh, gosh, Hank, you know, it's, what do you say? Like, are you a Hollywood legend? You've been around forever. Your life is incredible. Obviously, memoir grade, and we're going to talk about your book here in a second. For anybody who wants to get the book, there it is. Harlem Hoodlum to Hollywood heavyweight. And that is so true. Your story is incredible. Well, how would you de- define what you are uh, in Hollywood? I mean, you're obviously a pro actor. You've been in over 80 projects are, are you a legend what, what are you <laughs> i'm an actor <laughs> All right, that's fair enough uh, when somebody said legend i thought they were calling me a leg end <laughs> you're a foot <laughs> that's the end of my leg hey I'm so- an actor and i was a, a stand-up comic yeah You've been a lot of things. You've been a comic. You've been a professional wrestler. You've been a, a hood in Harlem, as the title says. And you grew up in a, in a harder time. I, I would say Depression, World War II, these are harder times than what we're going through now. I mean, problems are a lot different now. You know, we, everybody's got a cell phone for crying out loud. You know? I know. It's, it's, uh, it's a frightening time. I was a cop for about a minute and a half. The, what I saw then is absolutely nothing as compared to what's going on now. So you think it was harder, you think it's harder now to get along than it was back then? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The peace has driven people into their holes and afraid to go anywhere, do anything. Uh, Fortunately, my wife and I have both have gotten our shots and so, but we're still quite hesitant about going places. Yeah, but that's right. the, the, the complicating yeah. factor. Right? I was scheduled to do a couple of shows, and all the funds I, I earn, a good portion of it goes to disabled vets. I wound up, I started by going to the hospitals, the veterans' mm-hmm. hospitals, yeah. to perform to try to make someone laugh. And when I saw what was happening, I decided that I do autograph shows all over the country. In fact, different parts of the world. And what I did was decide that the proceeds would go to help these kids that are in trouble. I'm talking about the kid. I refer to our veterans as kids. Sure. I volunteered to go to Vietnam. I paid my own way. I went three times. I got to tell you, the the first time I hit the stage, a machine gun, and I yelled, critics! And all the kids were laughing. We took off, and uh, one of the GIs said, Mr. Garrett, Please don't make us laugh. We're trying to get the heck out of here. And we were running, and uh, and I just kept kidding around. Yeah, yeah. And we, at one point, we had finished doing a show. It was a boy singer, a girl singer, myself. And we were just sitting around, and he had the young, the young singer helmet off, and he was spinning 
the hat, I mean, on on the chin strap. And it just kept right. moving it back and forth. Next thing, it went flying. And he went to pick it up, and there was a hole, a bullet hole, through the helmet. Somebody stepped out of a hole somewhere, saw something glint, glint, bang. So it was that kind of a situation that was so frightening. You didn't know where it was going to be coming from next. But we continued. We hit that front line and we did the show. We just had, um, uh, there's a, a writer, I think actually one of uh, Harlan's uh, clients also, and she wrote a book about uh, Bob Hope called Dear Bob and about his time in the USO and entertaining troops. Mm -hmm. And it's just remarkable. Like, well, one, all of the work, the lifetime of work that guys like you have done, but also, you know, the times where he just misses. Like the guys he talks to the next day, a lot of them are, are dead because there is a big firefight or, you know, the airplane yeah. does crash or almost crashes and all these incredible oh. things. It's, it's insane. Talk a little bit about that, some of your experiences. Well, I look at the the GIs, and they were babies. They were little kids who were dressed up in uniform and helmets and, and carrying guns that were bigger than they were. And was we went to visit the moving wall. It was a list of all the kids we lost in Nam. So I was there. And a guy came up to me and he said, Mr. Garrett, I, re I remember you from Vietnam. He said, you made us laugh when there was nothing to laugh about. Yeah. And it killed me, just tore me up. And I just felt I have to give back. And that was one my way of giving back. And now we have the book. Uh, and everyone has said that this book has got to be a movie. Yeah. Okay. And I know where the proceeds will be going. Yeah. The proceeds will be going to the disabled American veterans. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a disabled veteran. And I'll tell you what. You know, there's never enough money. There are so many small problems that, that hits people who are disabled from combat. And it just becomes overwhelming, you know, and, and for a small amount of money, you can get a lot of people out of trouble, you know, who might otherwise I don't know, go to prison or, or you know, commit suicide or whatever it is. So I, I appreciate deeply you know, what you're doing. It, it does thank make you. it. Deep. And as I said, I thank you for your service. Yeah. Yeah. Let's wow. go back in time. I, yes. I want, to, I, want to, I want to ask you your angel. Uh, you have a very special angel, and uh, not everybody has an angel oh. like, like you do, but Sammy Davis yes. Jr. was your angel. Talk about that. I mean, you have all these incredible things that you've done, but talk about Sammy specifically for a few minutes. Oh, absolutely. Uh, being a kid on the street, always in trouble. Uh, my parents were quite, uh, they, were, they were immigrants from Russia, the Russian Jews, uh, and they had a push cart, and they sold fruits and vegetables off a push cart. Suddenly, I was born. Now, my, my dad was in his 50s. My mom was in her mid to late 40s. My two, bro my two half brothers were in the military. So what a surprise when they came home and saw me. Uh, in fact, my older brother constantly chided me by saying, oh, they found you in a trash can. <laughs> I said, I, he said, yeah, nobody wanted you. And so I lived with that. And what happened was I, because my mother and father had no time for me, they were 
just hustling, trying to make enough money to pay for food. I lived on the street. I actually slept in cardboard boxes, and I wasn't the only one. So now I'm always in trouble. My mother was crying to one of her customers who happened to be the mayor of Harlem. Because always fighting, always. I was so angry. I had nowhere to go. This street was my mother and my father. And I, and I remember one Christmas, every all the kids that lived on the block in the area had presents. They came out Christmas Day. I never got a toy. I never had a toy throughout my life. And I was really super angry. Uh, and for court, I got into a fight again. And my mom cried this man there, and he came to me. And, and I'm standing on a street corner smoking. And he came over to me and he tapped the cigarette out of my mouth. I didn't know who he was, and I'm going to throw a shot at him. But two mountains came toward me, his bodyguards. Right. And he introduced himself. And he said, uh, your mama wants me to take you out. And I said, my mother's putting a hit on me? <laughs> he said, no, dummy. I'm going to take you out this evening. You got a suit? And I said, yeah, I got it. Before you sit on that, take a bath. The running water in our home was rust. If you turned any faucet on, nothing rust. Okay, I put on my suit. It's me in his car. And it was the number one African-American theater. And I look up at the marquee and it says, starring Sammy Davis Jr. We don't go into the theater. We go around the back. And he goes right to Sammy Davis Jr.'s dressing room. And he said, this is the September. He said, this is the I sat down. He said, uh, you're a tough guy, huh? I said, yeah, I'm tough. He said, tough guy. I said, beyond that. He says, yeah, you're going to go to prison or you're going to die. Right. I had a pistol in my pocket. I had a 25 caliber pistol. And as he was telling me about it, these, these terrible things, that gun kept getting heavier and heavier and heavier. He wound up getting me a gig with an all African-American orchestra. Lucky Millinder. I never forgot his name. God bless him. He said, you're going to be a band boy. I said, I, I, I don't play an instrument. He said, no, no, no. You put out the music for each one of the musicians, and at the end of the gig, you put everything back in its proper order. And I said, oh, well, I did. And the end of the evening, we were at the Teresa Hotel in Harlem. Band leader came up to me and said, did a good job, man. And he gave me $50. 50 bucks. What? Yeah. yeah. And he said, Get yourself some new kicks, shoes. My shoes were torn to shreds. In fact, I had a big hand holding the sole in place. Well, next day I went and bought a pair of Florsheim shoes for fifteen dollars, and I gave my mom thirty-five more than she had seen all year, all her life. And Sam. I, I did the gig. I worked with the Lucky Melinda Orchestra for over a year. And then Sammy said, I want you to do a I said, for what? 
He said, learn. I want you to watch all the comics. You're, you're funny. I've, I've seen you doing some funny things. I used to do funny stuff to save myself from getting a beating from a bat from another gang. And a gang member years ago, prior to that, I was standing in front of my building and a kid walked up and punched me straight in the face and broke my nose. Nine years old, I got a busted nose. And so they said to him, why, why, man, why you hit that kid? He said he cursed my mother. I never saw this guy. Well, I'm watching all the comics. I'm learning. I'm taking little pieces of material from different comics. And I wind up performing up in the Catskills. Well, boy, somebody from the William Morris office sees me on the show. And I get signed to the Morris office. It's going to be Tony Bennett's opening act. I mean, from 111th Street between Park and Lexington to... Um, at the Sands. Yeah. Opening night at the Sands with Tony Bennett. Ringside, Frank Sander, Martin, Peter Lawford, and Sammy Davis. Finish my job. Frank gives me a standing ovation. And it was like, wow. Everybody after the show ran to see Tony. Except Sammy. Sammy just stood there and he said, you funny cat. Where do I know you from? You look so familiar. I said, Sam, I'm the kid that you said is going to go to prison or die. And he said, that's you? I said, yeah. We hugged, we cried, two of us just standing there looking and staring at each other and, and the tears rolling down our faces. And things started happening from there. Ah, Sammy was my angel. God sent me, this amazing man, to be my angel, to get me off the street. And now I go to prisons where children are incarcerated. And I speak to them and tell them where you are right now. I was there. I sat there. In fact, this is a, <laughs> a picture of me when I was a kid. Somebody did the sketch. So uh, I could not believe, and I, I prayed to God. I never was religious. Uh, it, that was something that was so foreign to me. But I had the need to do that. And I was told, do what you can, what you do best to help others as someone helped you. And so that's what I, I try to do. Uh, I do autograph shows all over, uh, pictures of Car 54, Three Days of the Condor, uh, and, and other movies and television shows that I've done. And I autograph them. And I sell them, and the proceeds go to disabled pets. So far, we've raised over sixty thousand. Wow, man, that's incredible! <coughs> I I want to get into I want to get into your fist fight with uh, with Robert Redford on the scene on, on the set, but let's let's first um, I'm going to close out the Sammy Davis Jr. part. Actually, let's back up. <laughs> I want to pass up the fact that you were opening up for Tony Bennett. What is, 
what is that like? What's the time frame from opening up for Tony Bennett from living on the streets with the hole in your shoe? Like, how long is that? How many years did it take to get oh, to the point where you're doing that? Well, uh, Sammy Pick got me off the street at 12. And I was, I thought, oh, God, I was in my 18th. <clears throat> I became a cop for about a minute and a half uh, because I, I wanted to make a difference. And we we'll the police force and I realized I, I could not make a difference. Everything was kind of set in stone. So a friend of mine who was a, a fellow comic, his wife was, uh, his name is Mickey Deans. His wife was Gertrude Nat Hyken. Nat Hyken created the Bill Go Show, Car 54, and other shows. And I, she got me an interview. And I sat there. <laughs> I didn't sleep all night the night before meeting this incredible giant. And Nat Hyken sat opposite me, very quiet, smoking. And he said, you're Ed Nicholson. And I said, oh, no, 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 I'm Hank Garrett. He said, just the kind of dummy I'm looking for. He said, Nicholson is the character on Car 54. <laughs> you are him. Yeah. I went, what? <laughs> And I went from being a cop for a minute and a half to being one of the stars on coffee for where are you? Yeah. Yeah. And I, all I you know, that's yeah. that's in, insane to go from the streets of Harlem being a cop to actually being a cop on a TV show. That's yeah, that's just such a different world. <laughs> oh God, is it? In fact, at one point when I told how does like a kid, how does a kid like, yeah, I told my commanding how, officer, how does a kid like you from Harlem? Go ahead. I'm sorry, I missed oh, the question. No, go ahead. You told your commanding officer. Oh yeah, and uh, I, I told the commanding officer. I said, "Sir, I, I'm leaving the job." He said. I said, well, I'm going to be doing a television show. He said, you'd rather be a comic on television or remain a comic on the police force? I said, yes, sir. He said, smart move. <laughs> How does a kid who lives in the streets with a hole in his shoe, you know, sleeping in cardboard boxes, how do you learn how to manage money well enough? It'd be easy for someone who doesn't have any money to just blow it all on things. But you've got this uh, Hollywood thing now, you're acting. How do you learn how to do the business and the, and the livelihood part of it? For uh, Sam, who had gotten, he was the one so from being the mobs. He had faced a lot of prejudice. In fact, he was appearing at the Sands and could not get a room to stay in. And Frank Sinatra, God bless him, told the people at the Sands, if, if Sammy Davis Jr. doesn't stay here, I'm pulling out and we, you'll never see us again. Well, they suddenly magically found a room for Sammy. Yeah. And that changed the picture in Vegas. When your question was yeah. with the money, uh, yeah. I became a hoarder. I didn't want to spend <laughs> any of this money. Oh, my God. Because I don't know if I'm going to have any, any money for tomorrow. Right. Sam got me with uh, a pit, somebody to handle money. And it was 
amazing. In fact, one night at the Sands, pay night, I'm in my dressing room, and Tony is next door. They hand me Tony's check by mistake. And I yelled, wow, what an increase. <laughs> the guy handing me out the checks comes running by, takes the check out of my hand, gives me my check, and I went, wow, what a cut I just took. <laughs> and Tony came over and he was laughing so hard. That's hilarious. And, uh, yeah, Ted, Tony was a wonderful, wonderful guy to work with. Oh my God. Do you get to talk to Tony Bennett at all, or do you guys? Oh, get to yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, not much because Tony was very involved in his free time. He was painting. Right. But at one time, I learned dialectic gibberish from Sid Caesar. <laughs> I had. I snuck into the theater that he that he was working in with his show, Sid Caesar. Now I'm sitting way up in the balcony. I snuck in. I went up the fire escape, the back of the building, and through the roof and into the theater. I, I don't ask me where I got the, the guts to do that. And at one point, I laughed out loud. And Sid stopped and said, who's up there? And I stood up. He said, you, come on down. I came down, and I thought he was going to have me arrested. He said, sit here. Put me in the first seat in the first row. He said, and you. Only laugh when I say things that are funny. Forget them. And I sat there and I watched. And he said, what are you doing, kid? I said, well, I want to be like you. I want to be a wonderful comedian. I said, you're my, you're, you, know, you are my, my star. My, my, there's nobody greater than you. And I, I had a way with dialect. Then it was from listening to radio when I was home. And I heard stuff and I learned dialectic gibberish. Now, when I was working with Tony, Tony and his accompanist were having breakfast. I walked over and I said, and it's all dialectic gibberish. A guy comes over with tears in his eyes and says, Oh my God, I haven't heard Sicilian spoken since I was a kid. Tony fell off his seat and he said to me, Sit down. And don't say a word. I said, okay. So, uh, as I said, he was very private. Very, very, very gentle. I'm a gentleman, truly a gentleman. He treated everybody with tremendous respect. Ah. Learned so much from the greats. You... Uh you went to a gala with Audrey Hepburn. Oh. I mean, come on, man. This is crazy. <laughs> Let's these things off one at a time. Okay. <laughs> uh, the, guy who, the guy who was my manager when I was wrestling, I wrestled as Hank Daniels, the Minnesota farm boy, which is interesting because I've never been to Minnesota. I never saw a farm. It was my moniker. I get a call from him, my manager, and he said, you want to pick up a few, you know, a couple bucks? I said, doing what? He said, bodyguard, escort. And he doesn't mean you got a suit. You have a tux. 
tents. He said, I don't know which they want you to wear, but you're going to escort a star. I said, oh, okay. I'm wearing my tuxedo. Uh, no, no, I wore the suit. And limousine comes to pick me up. Guy picks me up and we drive. He doesn't say much. Get to Malibu. He parks the car, says, I'll be right back. Goes and gets the woman. Brings her in and I look and it's Audrey Hepburn. And all I could do after I stepped on my tongue, just smile and uh, nah, nah. <laughs> and she says to me, hi. I said, nah, nah, nah. <laughs> she said, uh, you're Hank? I said, yes, yes, I am. She said, hi, I'm Audrey. I said, yes, I know. And she gets in the car and we go. And we're going to a fundraiser. Uh, proceeds going to Children's Hospital. We park. Chauffeur gets out. He stands. He opens the door for her. Sports around. I see other guys, other bodyguards and chauffeurs lounging around outside. So I go to join them. And Audrey says, no, 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 no. Hank, you're coming with me. I said, what? Yes, you're my escort. Walk in Beverly Hills Hotel. Walk in. Guy escorts, takes Miss Audrey Hepburn to her seat. I see a couple of guys standing around. I figure, well, old bodyguards. I go to join them. She says, Hank, you sit next to me. You're my date. I think I missed my mouth about eight or nine times in my forehead with the fork. I didn't know what to do. And I'm watching her and I eat whatever she does. She cuts a piece of meat. I cut a piece of meat. At the end of the people bid 25000 to have lunch or dinner with Audrey Hepburn. It's over, we're finished, we're heading back. Drive to her where she lives in Malibu. And she says to me, Hank, you are so sweet. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy life to escort me. And I went, oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for allowing me to escort you. I go back and the guy, the driver, takes me back to the hotel I'm staying at. And as I get out of the car, he says, you know something, Mr. Gary? You haven't stopped smiling since I picked you up. <laughs> he said, dude, can you say a couple of words? I said, no, man, I'm in, I'm in my reverie. Oh, it was just incredible. What a sweet, sweet lady. And did you ever talk to her again? No, no, never did. I never attempted to either. Yeah, I thought yeah. it would be you also out of bounds. Oh, for sure. You also had a significant encounter with Sophia Loren, and let's talk about her because, again, the list of insane things that have happened to you in your life and circumstances continue. So please, yeah, I, I was doing a movie uh, in the British West Indies uh, with Sophia Loren, James Coburn. He and I became close friends, and the scene is Sophia is the my boss is, I'm a bad guy for a change. Sophia is my, my boss's girlfriend. 
he wants to speak to her, he sends me to get her. And she's in a gift shop in a hotel. This is in uh, Antigua, British West Indies. I walk into the gift shop. She's standing there and I say to her, Oscar wants to see you. And she says, well, just tell Oscar to wait. And I say, nobody tells Oscar to wait. And I sweep everything off the table that she's looking at. I grab her arm and I yank her and throw her into the car. O.J. Simpson is supposed to rescue her. And what he's supposed to do is to take my head, bang my head against the car. He grabs Sophia and they take off. We go through, we rehearse. I said, all you have to do, OJ, is put your hand on the back of the head, my head. I'll do the hit. He don't want to play that way. Car door is open. He grabs my hair, slams my head on the edge of the car door and cuts me wide open. And down I go. Now I'm lying there bleeding. <laughs> Someone runs to get my then wife at the hotel. We're shooting right outside of the hotel. She comes running and she sees me in Sophia Loren's lap. And Sophia is blotting the blood on my forehead. And my wife says to me, are you comfortable? And I said, well, I make a nice <laughs> lady. She ran back to the hotel, packed, and left. So, I have to finish shooting. I'm going to be there for another week or so. One evening, well, we, uh, this is in New York, in Manhattan, and it's on, on 72nd or 73rd Street on the east side. There's a little private hotel. So we're just walking down the street. It's at night. I see a, the hotel door open. Two guys in suits are checking out the street, and they escort Sophia out of the hotel. She sees me and she runs over and says, oh, my poor darling, how's your head? She hugs me. I hear from the corner, taxi, taxi. My ex-wife, that was, she was my wife then, took off. And uh, the, we were soon divorced. My my episode with Sophia Loren. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Tell she us was, that Elvis Presley story. Uh, hey, by the way, did you live in Vegas, or were you just in Vegas at the hotels? Uh, I performed at the Sands quite often. And, uh, oh, wow. So, oh, well. I had the good fortune of working with some of the most incredible people in life. As I said, I'm truly blessed. I was at the Sands. A friend of mine was working with Elvis. He was Elvis's opening act. And he told Elvis, uh, Elvis was very much into martial arts. I am. I've been since uh, the age of 11. So I'm now a grandmaster. I wasn't then. And I get a call from one of Elvis's people. They said, would you, Mr. Garrett, would you do Elvis the honor of sparring with him? And I said, you want me <laughs> to do the honor? I said, oh, yeah, I'll give the kid a break. Well, Elvis rented one of the halls at the Sands, and he showed up with his entourage. I'm wearing my 
I paid a dollar ninety five for it, and it shredded. He shows up. He's wearing an outfit. Must have cost twenty five thousand. One leg in spangles, says Elvis. The other says Presley, and it's glittering. And I'm going. Is, he's going to spar with that. He had clothes that was stuff you had on top. Now he comes to me and he says, uh, "Sensei, which is teacher." And I said, no, no, you don't refer to me as sensei because you and I are equal rank. He said, oh, okay, sensei. He said, would you do me a favor, please? He said, try not to hit me in the face because I've got a show to do tonight. So I said to him, well, listen, don't hit me in the face because I too have a show to do tonight. He said, Sensei, if I hit you in the face, it would be an improvement. <laughs> I said, you know I'm going to kill you. You know that. And, so, and he was terrific. What a gentleman. Very, very obliging. I mean, so we. How was he as a fighter? How was his uh, style? Uh, he he just we just moved block you know we were going easy throwing kicks and again punches that that were easy to block and at one point I lost concentration because I'm thinking my God I'm sparring with Elvis Presley and he That's threw right. a fight. Yes. yes flat and he came down it was a flying side kick. And his foot was here. And I, because I lost concentration, I could have blocked or moved out of the way. But he pulled. And had he not pulled, I would be breathing through my nose and the back of my head. So I thanked him and thanked me. Uh, we spent a little bit of time together. And they took off. And that was the adventure with Elvis. And he, he was a, I learned what a true gentleman he is. Wow. Uh, he left a gift of wine I don't drink, but he, a couple of bottles of wine and a bottle of champagne that was uh, brought up to my room. Sweet, sweet guy. That's awesome. I love that story. So hey. since we're talking about fighting, we got to talk about the three days of the Condor fight with Robert Redford. You've, you've been getting beat up in the last couple of stories. So let's continue the theme. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Redford, a terrific guy, a gentleman at all points. I was cast, I am a, a CIA assassin. Uh, there is a book distributor, and they're distributing books that have secret messages. And we don't know who in the office has been reading the book and translating. So as I'm hired, I'm with Max von Sydow. I'm disguised as a mailman. And my job is to eliminate everybody in that office. Well, I come in, and first one I, I shoot is the re receptionist, the lovely lady. But as the director, Sidney Pollack, said, Hank, your job is to eliminate no hooks, no feeling, nothing because that's what you do. You are an assassin. So no expression on your face. It's a day-to-day -day situation. You go in, you kill, and you leave. Well, we should kill everybody in the office, except for Redford, who was out buying lunch for everybody in the office. He comes back, he sees what's happened, 
and he hides out in Faye Dunaway's apartment. We track him there. I come in and I'm about to deliver a package. And he looks at my shoes and they're brown Adidas. He realizes those are not regulation shoes. That was the tip off. So now we have this fight. And they, there was a, his had a double because I had to throw a kick uh, and a roundhouse boom and catch him in the shoulder and drive him. And I say to the double, uh, listen, I'm, I'm big, but I'm very fast. He said, uh, don't worry, you'll never touch me. I said, I just want to make sure, you know, that I don't want to hurt you. He said, I'll be gone before you get halfway through that kick. I said, okay, but I'm telling you, I am fast. Action. I catch him and I drive him right across the room. And he comes after that scene and he said, damn, you're fast. Now I got to fight Redford. Right. And there's a scene where I throw a sidekick and he's standing in front of a fireplace. Now, I don't know. It's the fireplace. So I throw, and when I do, I go right through the plywood, and my foot is caught. So now they had to go cut, and they ran around the back, had to untie my shoes so I could get my foot out of the <laughs> hole that I just created. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so, Redford, now there's a scene that is a close up of my, me getting coffee in my face because Redford grabs his pot of coffee and throws it at me when he realizes that I'm not a mailman. Right. He comes out of his dressing room and he sees smoke coming out of this pot of coffee. So he said, uh, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. We're not going to throw hot coffee in Hank's face. And the guy who was handling special effects said, oh, no, 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 it's not hot coffee. What it is, it's smoking uh, chemicals. He said, what chemicals? He says, well, it, uh, there's a, it's, it's an acid and diluted with mineral oil, but it's still smoke. He says, acid? And he walked to Sidney Pollack, the director. He said, Sidney, can I throw the coffee? He said, you're not in the shot. It's a tight close-up of Hank's face. He said, let, let me throw it. He said, sure. He said, Hank, I'm going to hit you waist high. And all you do is throw your hands up, cover your face as though I hit you in the face. Find out later if he had hit me in the face, it would have gotten in my eyes, it would have blinded me. How do I thank Robert Redford for saving my eyesight? I break his nose. <laughs> yes. Of course you do. I'll teach you, Bob, to mind your own business. Uh, and, uh, so when it happened, he, he said, ah, don't worry about it. My nose has been broken so many times. Because he, he was a good athlete, a lot, I did a lot of skiing, and he broke his nose skiing at one time. So he, I was very concerned. So that was my episode. And I wound up winning the New York Film Critics Award for Best Fight Scene in Film. And uh, not quite recently, within the last year or so, uh, we, we were taken to Vegas, and I received an award in Vegas, and it says, uh, best fight scene in film ever. Ever. Yeah, ever. It is a great fight scene. It's a good, it's a fun movie, too. I, I enjoy that movie. You've played a cop in a lot of things. You were a cop on Too Close for Comfort, one of my favorite shows. I think you might have been a cop on these. You know, you've 
You've been a cop in lots of things, man. What about you makes you a good cop? Well, I tried. As I said, I, I joined the police force. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And thanks to Sammy Davis Jr., he was so instrumental in my life. Yeah. And uh, when I talk to kids that, that are incarcerated, I tell them I had an angel, angel by the name of Sammy Davis Jr. And I got letters from these kids. And they said, Mr. Mr. Garrett, Sammy Davis Jr. was your angel. You are our angel. Wow. Wow. So now we, we're working on a thing, and it's called Hangster's Kids. We want to have a place for kids to come after school. If they're not going to school, come. Get off the street. The street is not your friend. We'll give you a place where you can be comfortable. If you're hungry, we'll feed you. If you're going to school and you, you need help with schoolwork, we'll, we'll help you with that. Just come. Get on the street. And so uh, we're working on that as well. Hanks, there's kids. Hanks, there's kids. And let's mention the book one more time. From Harlem Hoodlum to Hollywood Heavyweight. It's available on Amazon. You hear the stories, the impossibleness. We didn't talk about the times when he was a I mean, professional wrestler very much, other than mentioning the fact that, you know, you had a name and a character. But it's just, it's fantastic to have you on, Hank. It's just, you've lived such an incredible life. You've talked to so many and interacted with so many incredible people. I mean, Audrey Hepburn, Sophia Loren, Elvis Presley, Tony Bennett. I mean, Sammy Jr., come on. It's uh, it's an incredible life. Man. And I, I really, I appreciate you coming on the show and, and sharing it with us. And I'm excited to grab the book and, and give it a read. Oh, thank you. And uh, we're very proud of the book. I my manager, Deanna Marie Smith, if it wasn't for her, uh, there would no, there never would be a book. She sat hours just saying, and what happened now? And what yes. do you remember? And I, it brought all that back. And so here's the, uh, the cover of the book. Yeah. And we're very proud of it. And as I said, and the proceeds go yeah. to the disabled vets. So, and thank you for having yeah, me again, on. That book is the called Harlem. Harlem, 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 Harlem to Hollywood Heavyweight. Stand by a second.